Good evening, uh, and welcome to a series of critical conversations that we are having around uh, health, development, and art, uh, along with Scroll, Pi, and uh, Survivors Against TV. My name is Chakal Mehra. I'm a public health specialist and a writer. And today, we'll be discussing the power of music in the pandemic. Uh, I know we usually traditionally discuss far more serious issues, art issues, and, uh, but this has been an ongoing request by many people who have been saying that uh, this pandemic is sort of forcing us to look inwards and remain within our homes. And hence, music has played that critical role in uniting people, but also giving us solace, uh, giving us the power to relax and also look within ourselves. An important question uh, that lies here, uh, and as I introduce my guest, you will discover why we are discussing music with him, is the role of music in the subcontinent, because uh, the subcontinent has such a large and diverse history of music uh, and musical genres, and so much of it unites us across borders, across uh, languages, and even across generations. So without further ado, let me introduce my guest today. He's possibly one of the subcontinent's better known um, singers, Ali Tracy. Uh, Ali, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Shapal, for having me. Thank you. So uh, I know you're sitting in New York, and I'm yes. sitting in New Delhi. And we are in two cities that are the worst affected by this pandemic, mm. right? At least New York was, and New Delhi is now. And um, I wanted to turn to you and ask you this question about the role of music uh, at the time of this pandemic. You know, I mean, so many people talk to us about mental health issues and mental health issues. Music is a critical role. So, I mean, as an artist who is well known for certain genres of music, which is very good, what do you think of the role right now? Uh, well, I should tell you that um, when uh, I came to New York City on March 10th uh, mm -hmm. to in order, I flew in from Lahore. We just concluded a series of concerts in uh, Karachi, Lahore, in Pakistan, um, and I was about to embark on my uh, what what now seems like a golden misty memory uh, on our spring tour 2020 of North America. Right, so we had shows in. Um, you know, in, in uh, New York, in DC, in Florida, and here. I mean, like all those places that are now under lockdown or that have been, yeah. were listed on our on our naive little, sweetly naive poster that we floated everywhere. I got to New York on the 10th of March and three days later, um, very abruptly without uh, warning, the lockdown was imposed in New York City. So I've been here since the lockdown began, since the sort of whole quarantine um, thing began here in the US. And um, so first of all, I have not been able to do any of my live performances, my in-person concerts, as we're now calling mm -hmm. them. Uh, that's been one way in which I've experienced the lack of music. But, you know, the incredible thing about human beings is that we adapt always. We find ways of adapting. Um, you know, all we need is, is a little bit of, as we say in Urdu, tangi. You know, we need, we need, we need that sort of uh, confinement in order to in order to become creative very quickly and that's sort of what happened uh you uh, you know reported on this as well your publication did um i uh started doing these these sort of instagram live concerts uh completely without without uh mm -hmm. any kind of planning or uh, you know preparation and uh, i was joined by a bunch of really interesting artists from across the border uh from across the india pakistan border so mm -hmm. we had uh, Rekha Bhardwaj and we had Vishal and we had uh, Shilpa Rao and we had Zakir Khan and we had uh, Barun Grover and, and so on. And, um, you know, these became very popular very quickly. Um, and so we sort of, it, it became like kind of virtual methyls or adas, mm -hmm. you know, which, which I think um, uh, was a revelation because I found that not only did people want to hear music, they also, I suppose, in isolation and loneliness, being cut off from their loved ones, friends, dear ones. If you can generate that warmth and that feeling of, of togetherness, you know, um, I think that's a great, great service. So that's sort of how I've experienced music is that I've kind of renewed my, in some ways, musical um, attitude in this time 
by trying to uh, make it feel more relevant to how we are, the way we live now, as we say. I mean, music has become central in many ways, as has art in these times. <laughs> uh, it's sort of reviving our old history of uh, uh, celebrating our communities through music, right? Mm. I mean, I, I can see people around me are turning to the classics. There's been a rediscovery of old poetry, which is actually heartening. And there's also um, a discovery of fairs. For instance, uh, uh, you know, I'm making this a Muslim that has become so big in India and it's always been big in Pakistan. I wanted to ask you uh, how does uh, music unite us? And, uh, you know, we are sort of rediscovering our roots in it because uh, even your music comes to the studio. Yeah. We revered in love with lots of stuff. I think one of the things that's really beautiful about Desi music is that it comes to us um, from a moment of, I say a moment, I mean a historical period really, a thousand year historical period, when borders uh, were porous. I mean literal physical borders between cities, provinces, kingdoms, countries. Um, but I also mean um, borders, uh, of the imagination, borders of identity. Um, and, you know, I'm talking about that sort of what we call the Indo-Persian world or the Indo-Muslim world also, um, a sort of a, a map, a, 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 a magical map that existed for a thousand years where you had people of with with sort of, you know, people from Syria, from Damascus, Baghdad, from Cairo, from, um, you know, Central Asia, from, from Afghanistan, from Kashmir, from Bhopal, from Bengal, from from you know Banaras, um, from from uh, the south, from from you know the the, the Malabar coast, uh, interacting and and exchanging their wares. So the kind of music that say we perform today on Coke Studio in Pakistan is still an amalgam of all of those very very free in some ways um, interactions and cross pollinations that have happened within South Asian culture. Um, and I think, um, you know, our ideologies, our study of the study of history and other kinds of institutionalized uh, ways of learning have become very rigid, you know, whereas music, because somehow I think probably because of, because it's been neglected by the state, though, I mean, I can't imagine what a what, what musical propaganda would be like. I just don't want to even go there. Um, I think music contains still contains um, that sort of, you know, it, it carries us because it has the, the germs of, as it were, of our, of our, of our Dostana interactions. I think mm. it takes us back into a place where we are free, where we are not held hostage to hate, um, you know? Mm. What about your own musical history? I'm always intrigued by it because you started out as a writer in a sense, and I remember reading somewhere where you said that your mother engaged the master did that you would run around the room trying to not engage with the master who trying to teach you the child trying to teach you music at all. And then you came into music and are now got to be kind of a company from the voices. I, I grew up listening to a lot of music. My mother played a lot of traditional music to us in the home. So we heard a lot of Kavali and Ghazal and, uh, you know, a lot of folk music. Um, mm. And we, we would go on long, you know, we would drive up to, to the, uh, uh, the mountains um, in the northern areas of Pakistan in the summer. And we would all the way long, we, you know, my mother would play this, this very in some ways, unfiltered traditional music. So 30, 40 minute Kavalis by Nusrat Fateli Khan and, mm. uh, you know, the sort of long, beautiful ghazal renditions of Farida Khanum, who had then studied, had the, had the privilege of studying music with as well, etc. And I think, you know, having that early exposure, uh, it gave me a way to think about my uh, cultural identity that was not exclusionary, you know, that was not based on, from what I, what I read at school, what they made us memorize at school was Pakistan is a Muslim country. It is a country made in order to, you know, promote Islamic way of life. It's a, and that by implication, you know, excludes anybody who doesn't fall. I mean, even within, 
you know, Islam, quote unquote, then you start to differentiate, oh, who is a Muslim, who is not. You know, it becomes a Sunni, Wahhabi, <laughs> male, you know, all of that. It just never ends. You know, when you start to exclude, you just keep excluding until there's nothing left. Um, so this this sort of alternative healing that I had through music gave me access to uh, a kind of local identity, not a westernized or a kind of, uh, you know, colonial constructed identity, but a, a kind of organic local identity that opened up this 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 miraculous map of the subcontinent to me. Even as a child, I could feel it. I could feel that this music, the way that, that, that these singers sing, you know, the melodies, the words they use, the mm -hmm. repetitions, the refrains, the way the tabla and the whole sound and the kind of, you know, the sort of very interesting jugalbandis and dynamics they make, this encodes, um, you know, a, a, a mystical attitude, which, which then I, when I went to college, um, when I went to Harvard, I studied it uh, there with Professor Ali Asani, and I found that yes, indeed, you know, the Bhats and the Sufis did sit down and and you know, over many hundred years, codify these practices. So many of the great uh, musicians um, of the subcontinent were also Sufis, were also Hakims, were also healers. In fact, that link between healing, medicine, science, music, art, literature. That only gets broken in the colonial period when you kind of carve everything up into different boxes, you know. Before that, the Eastern approach is 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 holistic, right? So I've been very lucky studying music with Ustad Nasiruddin Sami for the last twelve years. I found um, shelter in his in his approach, which is exactly that approach, the holistic approach. You know, one minute where where uh, sort of singing a rag, and the next minute, you know, we're talking about how certain. Um, uh, certain drugs uh, are meant for certain times of day because they induce a certain effect on the body and on the mind and you know what that you know how that ties in with mystical poetry and it's a, it's a really incredible way of being and I wish more young people today in the subcontinent especially as they're being fed on on all sides of, of our borders unfortunately these these narratives of othering and exclusion and hate you know if only they could have a taste of what I have tasted uh, in this musical realm, I think they would find it much easier to love. I mean, I think it's interesting that you said a, a number of very uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, different strands and narratives uh, that are critical to this, this culture that we were referring to. Right. You know, whether it is uh, uh, Amir Kukro uh, and uh, the, the fabulous poetry, which is all spiritual, yeah. or it is the rediscovery of uh, Bulle Shah. Right. Uh, uh, in many ways, or um, you know, the rediscovery of uh, of so many others that uh, we know. I know you you were from Lahore, and uh, Shah Hussain's poetry is is one of the uh, most interesting, but also in these times, one of the most fantastic ones yeah. that uh, you would read in a long time. Um, I want you to reflect a little bit uh, on that because I then also want to ask you about Farida Khanum, who yes. is who has taught you, but is in many ways one of the last surviving groups who's lost the new Yes. And, uh, you know, we, we are poorer every day. So tell me a little bit about her and your relationship and how. Uh, well, it's I, it's a, it's a really interesting story. I, uh, so as I mentioned, I grew up listening to a lot of her music because it was in our, in our home. Um, and, and when I was 17 years old, um, I uh, went to see her. I said to my mother, I said, please, we have to, we have to see her. I just heard Ajani Ki Jitna Karo and thought this was an extraordinary uh, song. And I wanted to go and see her and I wanted to ask her, you know, to guide me, to help me find um, my, uh, my to, to kind of inaugurate my musical journey, if you will. Uh, so we went to see her. And she humored me and she, you know, she was very kind and she offered us chai and samosas and, and then she said, kuch, kuch gungunao, gao. And I sang a bit of uh, a Rafi Saab song, jo vada kiya, wo padega. And she said, you know, hmm, baad achye, baad achye, bagara, bagara. Um, I was just about to head off to college. And so she said, you know, she said we were, she indicated to me, she said, you know, we were um, very little when we were made to sit with the ustads and sort of study and learn and, there and practice. Um, and it's a it's a it's an all-consuming thing. It's not something classical music is not something that you can do as a hobby or as a mm -hmm. you know even as just a vocation. You can't do it seriously like that. It has to be. It, you have to treat it like a craft. 
Um, and I completely understood what she was saying. Um, but I think over the next several years, I mean, it really took about 10 years of constantly, you know, uh, getting to, to know her and spending time with her. And also it was a, in some ways a kind of, uh, it, it was a way for me to, to study and immerse myself in a world that had already vanished in Pakistan. You know, Farida Khanum is somebody who came of age um, as a singer in the 1950s and 60s um, in, a, in a very different world. Um, she was born in Amritsar in the 1930s, in the early 30s. She was studied music with Ustad Bade Ghulam Ali Khan, with Ashik Ali Khan, with, you know, um, uh, uh, new Begum Akhtar as a child, um, you know, uh, grew up between Calcutta, Amritsar, Lahore, Bombay. It was in some ways a very cosmopolitan and very dynamic world that she, you know, knew people like Manto and people like, uh, and then later that she uh, sang uh, Fez's puzzles and poems and he, he would often give his poems to her and say, you know, Ye DJ, and then she would compose them and sing them, etc. So it's not just a, I don't think it's just a nostalgic exercise for me. I think for me, it was kind of recovery of what we call mahal in Urdu, you know, and a mahal is not just, it's not just a, an environment or an atmosphere. I think a mahal means a community of art, a community of artists, a community of thought and a community of feeling. Uh, I think that's what I was trying to recover. And she really helped me find those you know, retrieve those threads that I think had kind of more or less vanished. So my relationship with her, of course, I she's been very kind. She's especially in these last five years, I've had some very rigorous riyas with her where we've sat for, you know, four or five hours at a time, just going at a raga, you know, the, the until I'm almost in tears and then she'll finally say, fine, go home now, you know. Um, she's she's a taskmaster and that's the, I, I, I love her for it because that's the sign of a, of a, of a good star is that they really take you to task, you know. Um, but I think even in, I was just thinking a few days ago, you know, I, I now I'm composing a lot of music and and they just come to me, these tunes and things, and I think back, you know, oh, this is this is an exercise that I have done with her. This is an exercise that I have done with Ustad Nasiruddin Sami. These, what we call paltas or what we call um, you know, our laps and things. It's these, it's these melodic, rhythmic, uh, counter melodic, counter rhythmic movements. This is what khayal is. This is even what ghazal and khawali is. Is that you know, you it's an adventure because you internalize the melodic framework and then you get creative with it. Then you have fun with it. You know. So so so, I think that part of it actually, it's like uh, I want to say it's like an algorithm that the Ustad imparts to you. You know, it's how to improvise within a melodic rhythmic structure. So at, at, at one level, you're completely paband, as we say in Urdu. You are confined by the rules of the raga or the rules of the theka of the setin tal or ektala. But on the other hand, you're completely free, right? Because you are expected to innovate and improvise and do, you know, the, the, where, where you, which we see in the in the great ghazal performances and kawali performances. Nusra Fadeh Ali Khan Sahib, who's the great, you know, the most dynamic showman of traditional Eastern music. What makes his music so thrilling and exciting is precisely that, is that you never know when he's going to go off, you know, on a trip and then you'll go with him and then he'll bring it back. But he's not exiting the, the raga. He's not like, you know, uh, he's not he's not reinventing the wheel. But he's but he's he's being completely dynamic and creative. I think that's the beautiful paradox about Desi music, and that's what Farida Ji has. I think. I mean, I don't know if I've been able to absorb it, but that's what she's been trying to impart to me: is how to improvise well. I mean, I think this is uh, this is great because you've described in uh, in in uh, a lot of detail the whole uh, the the process of learning under a great star and also a very versatile one because she yeah. is. Truly a versatile voice. Uh, uh, I also wanted to turn to this question of poetry because you know whether it was Farida Khanam or it was the Kalbano or it was the Sulemai or it was the Beshari. The ease, and of course, I'm not even going to mention Vega Master because she's omnipresent across the subcontinent of the mm. uh, I still remember this wonderful story uh, in one of Farida Khanam's interviews about how she used to sing Vega Master with the Rana Banana. And that's how somebody said to her, you can sing, uh, you, you have a beautiful voice. But the poetry is something that we are, uh, in some cases, we are discovering that we are also using because the easy and the fair, or a host of others. 
Now, what is the role of poetry for us in your life? Because mm. it is a certain time, a certain genre of the basic music that we do. And uh, I feel like poetry is a critical role. Mm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the it's an interesting question. Thank you for asking it. I've, it's a question I've been asking myself a lot because when you go through the whole Karana style, uh, you know, training, uh, rigmarole, you obviously are dealing with, in some ways, inviolable, sacred texts, right? The bandishes are hundreds of years old. The tumris are also hundreds of years old, you know. And even now when we, I mean, by the time I was, um, you know, doing my riyazat with my with my teachers, I would listen to, say, uh, the same tumri that I'm practicing now, with Pivana, not, uh, you know, Baju Band Kul Kul Jai or, uh, yeah. You know, and then you go on, go on YouTube and and look for look up. You know, the the original, the the Rasulun Bai version or the Siddeshwari Devi version or you know the Ustad Fayaz Khan version, and those also are almost a hundred years old now. You know, so yeah. I think I think there is that element of like you know you ha only attempt this if you're going to completely faithfully reproduce it. Um, mm -hmm. And that you can't really be creative with it or tamper with it, but I think what's this is a it's it's another beautiful paradox of Desi music um, and of Desi craft really, which is that it asks you to internalize the rules to the point where you can kind of work with them blindly, almost right. It asks you to just immerse yourself in the rules, in the kanuns, in the molds, in the attitudes of the great ustads who have gone before you. And mm -hmm. it requires, I think, at least 10 years of being inside that, you know, swimming in that swimming pool, as it were. And then yeah. I found this. You can come to a point where you feel like you can take a tukra from a tumri or you can take a misra from a ghazal and you can weave your own little small, you know, contribution around it. Mm -hmm. um, I did try to do that with the song Chan Nirat, where we had this um, verse from Shafuddin Saf's Ghazal, Chan Nirat Badi Der Ke Baad Aai Hai, Lab Pe Ek Baad Badi Der Ke Baad Aai Hai, which has also been featured famously in the movie Pakiza. Pakiza. I was browsing the Rehta website as one does um, on lonely nights, uh, you know, just going through, you know, interesting Urdu Ghazals, and I came upon this one and I thought this is so interesting. Uh, you know, the whole India Pakistan. Um, uh, I mean, I shouldn't call it a war, but our, our tense period was just beginning. This is about two years ago. Um, and um, I saw it and I thought, you know, this feels like, a, it feels like what it feels like when we go to Vaga for a candlelight vigil or when we cross a border and meet those that we have been separated from, um, you know. Um, so I had already read a kind of political dimension into it. But then I thought the rest of the poem, you know, remains in the original, it remains inside this romantic, lyrical, you know, sort of sort of space and I thought well I would love to add two couplets to this mm -hmm. that that while remaining within the behar of the ghazal while remaining within the meter I want to add two couplets that express my point of view so mm -hmm. I sat down with Shaquil Sohail who was a great uh, um, you know poet and lyricist in Lahore and we we wrote these um, uh, wrote these two couplets um, and then I composed them based on a raga that I had studied with Ustad Nisiruddin Sami. And um, and there it was. And then we got the video made. And the response we got was extraordinary. Even today, I wake up every morning and I see, you know, dozens of people in India, Pakistan, and the diaspora singing Chandni Raad Badi Der Ke Baad Aai Hai. And they're tagging me. And young people relate to it. So I find that there is a ghazal. There's a 100-year-old ghazal. There's a, you know, at, at least a 250-year-old raga, God Sarang, that we find mention of in, in beautiful Pahari miniatures, um, you know. And and there they are with this modern video made by Sarmat Kusat and Avas Kohar in this kind of dilapidated greenhouse in Lahore. And and this is how we've been able to meld these otherwise disparate, very disparate elements. There's an element of the traditional, there's an element of the classical, there's an element of the folk, and there's an element of the completely modern, quote unquote. You know, and they come together rather well. So it is possible. But I think you do have to, in order to get there, you do have to go through, in my experience at least, you do have to go through a rigorous apprenticeship where you are not, in fact, uh, tampering with the, the structures that have been masterfully created, perfected by the maestros who have gone before. 
I think a kind of respectful immersion in the in in the craft is very important. Um, uh, and then yes, it is possible to extend it into a into a contemporary idiom, which is what I try to do. I don't know if I'm successful at it or not. So this is my particular agenda, by the way. I don't think all young people share it, and I don't think they have to. I think if you're a bit of a you know um, sort of if you're addicted to classical forms like I am, and like I, I'm gathering you are too, I think then you then you you know then then you can you can try to do this kind of thing. Uh, now I have to say we are. I do have a meeting in ten minutes. So can right. we can we now sing a little bit so you can record that? Uh, yeah, I mean I think there's a host of requests uh, that we should uh, just do Chandi Rat, I think, and that'll really okay. that'll right. sum it up nicely. Yeah. yeah. So okay. I mean, I think if you mention Chandi Rat, we will do Chandi Rat. I Thank think that's you. the idea. Yeah. Just give me yeah. a minute. I'm just going to bring my harmonium and switch off the AC so you get okay. good audio. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here we go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So guys, I'm going to try to make this as smooth as possible. Uh, I hope the harmonium doesn't drown me out. Thank you. Thank, for, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for, for doing this. And it was lovely. I, I just wanted to ask you one last question. Yes. A minute. Which, and since this uh, carries away from the poetry that you spoke about, which is yeah. the poet that you most enjoyed singing? Oh, that I enjoy singing. Yeah. Ah, I personally think Fez for me is the great, great great the poet of my heart the poet after my heart the poet who really kind of feels the most relevant the most the most complete to me um because he really he really embodies that attitude that approach to to life and to art that i i idealize uh you know which is uh, he is at once traditional and modern he is at once uh you know uh, mystical and and political. He is at once uh, Eastern and international. Uh, he is a great reconciler uh, of of binaries, of opposites, of things that are not supposed to come together, and yet they do. And I think this is why we still sing Fez. This is why you know when we when we are in in dire need of of, of deliverance, we turn to Hamdeh Kenge. This is why when when we you know miss someone. 
who we are who we are far removed from with sing the stetan hai me and so on etc i think it's the mark of a great poet that they that their work applies endlessly to novel situations and i think faz is in my opinion the last great poet in that that mystical tradition well thank you so much i i couldn't thank agree you. more i'm a big faz myself thank you so much ali for being with us take care thank you Have take care bye